Welcome back, friends and listeners, to your favorite true crime podcast, Truth, Lies, and Alibis, by two 911 dispatchers. Episode 12, Crimes of Opportunity. In this episode, we begin our talk on the Hammer Killer, a violent man who committed a string of terrible crimes where the victims only had one thing in common, an open door. Hi, Jess. How are you? I'm good. How are you? (laughs) Wonderful. It snowed again. I thought it was over. I almost put away my winter jacket. Yeah. Don't do that. Maybe not till like May, June. I'm not going to put it away until June. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could be snowing until then. You never know. I hope not. <laughs> Jessica's okay going to cry. Rain. I love rain. If it would just warm up a little bit so that the snow would melt on the way down. Monsoon so by the time season it is my touches favorite. things. Yeah, same. Maybe we'll have um, fireworks this year. You know, <laughs> we could, and then given how things have been going recently, it would only start a fire. That's true. There would be a wild land for sure. Which is a real bummer, because I really actually like the fireworks. I should. <gasps> we should go to Disneyland on July 4th. No, thank you. <laughs> I will not go to Disneyland, A, in the summer, or B, on any sort of holiday. <laughs> you could not get me there. <laughs> okay. Thought I'd try. I am an I am an off season gal. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Okay, bum me out now. <laughs> I was gonna say, are you ready? Because this one's a rough one, and it's gonna be a two parter, everybody. So buckle up. We will do part one this week. Next week will be part two. It'll be two depressing weeks in a row. There will be no movies or pizza in this one. Sorry. <laughs> Probably not a lot of laughter either. So. All right. Today's resources include People Magazine, People Investigates, Denver 7, ABC, and Las Vegas Review Journal. I found out about this story specifically through the People True Crime Stories. It has a lot of good stories in it. So, on August 9th, 1984, Nancy Berry called 911 to report an unknown male had broken into her home and attacked her and her husband with a club. Nancy begs for the 911 dispatcher to send help, telling her, and this is a quote, we're dying. When responding officers arrive on scene, they enter the house from the front yard. They can hear screams from outside the home upon their arrival. They find blood everywhere, and Nancy Berry, who has two broken arms, while her husband, Chris, is severely beaten with multiple head wounds. They also found the handle of a broken axe spotted with blood that they believed was used in the attack. The couple are worried about their two young children who are in the home. Their infant child and their two-year-old are in another room and they're unharmed. The couple are then rushed to the hospital. Nancy tells investigators that she heard a strange noise when she went to the kitchen to make a bottle for her infant child. And that's where she sees a male subject standing with the broken axe handle. She turns to run towards the bedroom and calls to her husband to call for help. She's like telling him there's someone in the house Call the police. Mm -hmm. The male subject is too fast and attacks the couple with the axe handle, brutally beating them. Between the yelling and chaos, Nancy makes a call to the police and the attacker flees, leaving the axe handle behind. When police arrive, it's pretty obvious that Chris has various serious injuries. All he's wearing is his white underwear and it's completely covered in blood. His whole body is covered in blood Mm. and his face is pretty badly beaten. And when they enter the residence, he like tries to crawl away from them because he believes the attacker is still in the house. Mm -hmm. And this is a quote from Nancy Berry later. She said, He was long-term affected. He lost his sense of smell. His jaw was out of alignment, so his bite was all messed up. He couldn't taste food anymore. His eye kind of was set back in his head, and then there was scarring all over his face from the attack. Nancy had several broken bones in both hands and her wrists and had to undergo surgery for a head injury. And one of the articles I read, it said that he was brutally beating her husband and she kind of tried to stop the blows with her hands, which is how she got her wrists broken. She describes her attacker as a white male with red shorts. And this description matches the description of an inmate who had escaped hours earlier when being transported from Utah to Arizona for court. Mm. The responding officers missed the subject as he fled through the back of the house because they entered from the front and nobody went around to the back. They believe he must have fled northbound towards the desert out of the back door, and they are unable to locate the subject, so every officer of the Henderson PD is called to assist with the search for the subject. 
They utilized helicopters, canine officers, tracked his shoe prints, but were still unable to find the suspect. Investigators released the description of the subject to the press and tell everyone in the area to lock their doors. Two days later, on August 11, 1984, an operator was monitoring a call made from a payphone at Lake Mead. Do you remember payphones? I, I do. <laughs> I can't say I know that I knew that they were monitored. Yeah, it's a little like weird. that somebody just listened into calls. Apparently, I don't know if he was like calling collect, maybe? I don't remember oh, how that worked back in maybe. the day. Like, every time I ever used a payphone, way back in the day... I just use change. I never use yeah. like a calling yeah. card or calling collect or anything. So maybe he was calling collect. Maybe. But the caller calls his brother and tells him that he broke out of prison. Come get me. Like he's like, I broke out of prison. Come get me. So two days later. Yes. Two days later. Okay. This operator then calls the police because she connects that this might be the subject who was on also regardless the news. And yeah, like also somebody, like somebody saying that they got out of prison. <laughs> I broke out of prison. Yeah, that's suspicious. Okay. <laughs> I should probably tell somebody about that. <laughs> so she calls the police and the park rangers respond because it's their area. And upon their arrival, the white male subject with no shirt and red shorts tries to run from the officer. He runs about 400 yards and then falls over. He's exhausted and seems to be dehydrated. He was arrested and on September 12th, 1984, he's formally charged with the two counts of attempted murder, two counts of battery with a deadly weapon, one count of escaping police custody, and one count of burglary. What was he in jail for in Utah? And being extradited, I'm guessing, to Arizona? Okay, so this is where it gets weird. You have it in... No, it's okay. Oh, wait. (laughs) The subject arrested is Alex Ewing. He is in custody being transported to Kingman, Arizona to face charges for a break-in he committed in Kingman on January 27, 1984. That morning, at around 12.05 a.m., he breaks into the home of Roy Williams. Roy woke up to find Ewing standing over him with a giant 25-pound rock. He struck Roy multiple times in the head as well as the abdomen, cracking some ribs. Roy said, what did you do that for? And Ewing fled. Because he's, like, kind of in shock, and he's like, what the fuck? (laughs) Like anyone would be. Yeah. Roy calls police, but is unable to describe his attacker since it was dark in the room when he was attacked. And he he doesn't know him at all. Like, later on, there's no connection between his attacker Mm. and himself. The only evidence they can find is a unique shoe print in the yard. Kingman PD then puts out an APB for the subject, and I'm sure most people know, but that's an all-point bulletin. It goes out over the radio so that any officer in the area might be able to assist with finding them. Seven hours later, an officer spots a hitchhiker not too far from Roy's home, and when he stops to talk to the hitchhiker, he asks to look at Alex's shoes. The tread on the bottom of the shoes matches the tread found on Roy's front yard, and when the officer asks Alex to go to the station for questioning, he takes off. 30 minutes later, they find Alex hiding behind a bush and they arrest the 23-year-old drifter and charge him with burglary and attempted murder. He tells police that he had hitchhiked from Colorado to Arizona and at the time, the Mojave County Jail was so full that they sent him to wait for trial in St. George, Utah. Interesting. That's what I said. Nine months later, on August 9th, 1984, is when he was being transported from Utah to Arizona on a prisoner transport van when they stopped at a gas station in Henderson, Nevada. The guards unshackle the prisoners while they use the restroom, and he's being transported with, like, 12 other people. And when the guard turns their back, Alex Ewing flees, which I'm like, you had one job. Why would you do that? (laughs) One job, sir. We've all watched movies and TV shows. We know what happens when you turn around. Right? Somebody runs away. (laughs) Turn around. That's all I hear. (laughs) Anyway, the guard turns around and then Alex Ewing flees. He runs to a nearby Kmart. Another inmate witnesses this and tells guards immediately. Well, you remember Kmart's? <laughs> I actually, I think there's still a Kmart in where we both lived, isn't there? I think it's closed. I don't think that's really anymore. because when yeah. I lived there, I used to go there because Jude would only wear shoes that I could buy there. I don't think it's been open for years. That's a bummer. Another inmate witnesses this and tells guards immediately. This is when they call Henderson PD and they search for hours and into the night for Alex. Until a series of calls describing a subject trying to get into people's homes and then Nancy's 911 call, they have no idea where he could be. So did they have officers in the area then of her neighborhood? They had officers searching the area 
And it sounds like people were calling in because he was trying to get into people's houses. Right. I think that he picked their home based on his ML before because the door was unlocked. It sounds like he didn't necessarily pick their home. He was just going home to home looking for an unlocked door. Yep. Which brings us to the night when he breaks in, attacks Nancy and her husband, Chris. Lock your doors, people. Yes. And then the monitored call from the payphone and he's arrested. So... On February 28th, 1985, Ewing was found guilty of attempted murder, battery with a deadly weapon, escaping custody, and burglary. He's sentenced to 110 years in prison, but has the possibility of parole. To which I say, if you think, I'm sorry, if you think somebody is so dangerous that they should serve 110 years in prison, why are you letting them have the possibility of parole? Well, and it's too, like, considering the type of crime, too. Like, it's not only is it violent crime, but it's hands-on physical violence. Like, he took a weapon and bludgeoned somebody. His previous one, he took a rock and bludgeoned somebody. Like, that's hands-on need to create violence. Need to feel the person's bones breaking. Yeah. Like, that's so insanely violent. It's very different from breaking and entering and shooting someone. Yes. Like, uh, 100% both agree. are very bad. Don't do them. <laughs> As we've said before, don't commit murder. But there's a difference between shooting somebody and actually just brutally beating them. It's There's like a, a personal level to it. Like, regardless of if they know the victim or not, there's a personal level to them getting the blood on them and like feeling and all the, the impact anger of your weapon on them. Like that's mm-hmm. very personal and very up close and very deranged. Yeah. Sure. Let's give that man parole. <laughs> it's awful that he completely ruined that guy's life too. I mean, he completely ruined well, and a lot of people's lives. He would have kept going but... if Nancy wasn't able to call 911. Yep. And she and him would probably be dead. And who knows Absolutely. who else would who be dead? Who knows about their kids? Yeah. yeah. It's, well, we'll get to it, Jess. At this time, they drop the charges for the attack in Kingman, satisfied that he will spend significant time in prison for the attempted what? murder. Why? I don't control the justice system. If I did, things would be <laughs> so different. Come on, Brittany. So different. So that doesn't that doesn't even make sense to me. That like, oh, we won't charge him for that because he's being charged for another crime. Like, what about that? He's still probably because they're like, oh, we just crime. don't want to waste the money. Do you know yeah, what I mean? He, he beat a man. I am with you. <laughs> I am 100% with you. I'm all for let's try the person who beat someone with a rock. But yeah. they probably were like, oh, we don't want to waste money. Our jail- jails are jail. overflowing. He's going to be in yeah. prison for a long time. He got 110 years. Hey, Brittany. Hmm. Uh, Also, I'm putting this in recorded history, too. If something happens to me and the suspect is also guilty of another crime and they're like, oh, it's okay," Like, they'll spend time for that. I also, as the victim, would like to press charges. (laughs) If that were to ever happen, which it better not, because I would cry. I can guarantee you, me and Kylie will do whatever the fuck it takes to make sure that person faces justice, Jess. But I ask the same in return. Absolutely. (laughs) Just say, no, 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 no. That's not what Brittany would want. She doesn't care if he's got five life sentences. She wants a life sentence for her. I exactly. That's exactly it. I don't care if they've got five. I would like to be the sixth life sentence, please. So, when asked, Williams said, and this is a quote, and I just had to leave it in there because Kingman, I just assumed at the time that he's just another crazy guy on crystal meth, you know? I mean, if you know anything about Kingman. I mean, some people from Kingman are real nice. I have a couple of friends. I know people from King- Yes, but, but if you know anything <laughs> about Kingman. Some people from Kingman are crazy guys on meth, you know? Just like he said. So, anyway, moving on. In 2018... 33 years after his sentencing, Ewing is about to be eligible for parole. I'm going to give you 110 years, but you know what? You only have to serve 33. And he was in his 20s when he went to jail? Yes. Ewing is about to be eligible for parole and is optimistic about the possibilities freedom might bring. He even set up a dating profile. Sure. I just, (laughs) sometimes I'm just so stunned. But should I be, like, should I really be surprised? (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. What did he put in his profile? I've been out of I've been out of the game for about 33 years, been in prison, almost killed a couple people. But, you know, 
I'm I, optimistic about getting back out there. I really like throwing rocks. I'm very good with my hands. I like camping in bushes. Really like running. So <laughs> <laughs> pastimes include I think woodworking, <laughs> running. <laughs> masonry i'm sorry it's not funny but it is because we gotta find some laughter somewhere people (laughs) you have to find the humor in it but he says in his dating profile he's looking for an outdoorsy woman you're no longer joking with me are you no (laughs) i'm not i'm not joking i am laughing but i'm not joking (laughs) so that was in the 80s Mm -hmm. this is 2018 2008 oh my that's not even that long ago (laughs) nope guess what guys I was on dating websites in 2018. Uh, (laughs) I did not know that inmates were allowed to have dating websites. So, you know, be careful out there, people. Be careful. Okay. However, there will be no meeting up with any online love interests for Ewing. Right before his hearing for parole, his DNA is linked to a string of attacks in Colorado that occurred in 1984, just before the attack on Roy Williams. Did he just delete his plenty of fish or was he like (laughs) looking for someone to visit me in prison? Just updated his location. Looking for conjugal visits? Anybody want to marry an inmate? On January 4th, 1984, newlyweds Kim and Jim Hobbenshield. How cute. I think that's how you say it. That's how I heard it pronounced. Were home in the house they had just purchased six months earlier. With their new home, being newly married, Kim and Jim were optimistic about their future. Kim told People Investigates that she felt, and this is a quote, young and invincible. Jim was up making mixtapes until around two in the morning that night. Oh, remember mixtapes? Yeah. Back in the day. You have to wait for that song to come on the radio and then hit record real quick. Me and my friends used to call and request songs and be like Uh waiting to record it. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good old days. I wonder if some of our listeners don't even know what tapes are. Like mixtapes are like... Huh? What's that? I always burn CDs from, what was that? LimeWire? And Napster. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> Jem's up making mixtapes for an aerobics class until around two in the morning, and then Kim went to bed before him. When he finally goes to bed, he forgets to close the garage door. <sighs> Kim wakes up in the middle of the night to find a male subject standing over her with a hammer. She feels a sharp pain in her head and can feel something warm running down her face. She yells to her husband, Jim, there's a man in the house throwing hammers, and then the subject flees. The Hobbin Shields are transported to the hospital where investigators ask him about the attacker. She tells them it was too dark and that all she can say is that he was rather large. Kim's purse is found rummaged through and discarded, but nothing is missing. A claw hammer is found, and Kim tells investigators it isn't their hammer, and it is the weapon of choice of their attacker. It's bloody, and it matches their wounds. Mm. Okay. Both Kim and Jim had been beaten with the hammer. Investigators find no sign of forced entry and believe the subject entered the home through an unlocked door to the house. Kim told People Investigates that they had to manually close the garage and make sure the garage door was locked. She couldn't remember if either of them had done that that night. Investigators asked Kim if the neighbors could be responsible for the attack. They had tracked footprints in the snow to the neighbor's patio, but then tracked them to where they got lost in other tracks. She tells them no one she knew would do this. Kim didn't know her attacker, Alex Ewing. They're all crimes of opportunity. Yeah. All the doors are open. He enters usually through the garage. Yeah. On January 10th, 1984, six days after the newlyweds were attacked, 50-year-old Patricia Smith was eating lunch in her Lakewood, Colorado home when she's attacked by Alex Ewing. She had just moved to Colorado with her daughter in 1983 when her daughter was going through a divorce. She moved to help with her grandkids. Patricia was an interior designer and is described as a wonderful mom and grandma who was always smiling and positive. Her granddaughter describes her as a very strong person, and she says, you always knew who was in charge, so she was the boss. Patricia had dropped her daughter off to the park and ride that morning, but had failed to return later that evening to pick her up. Her daughter, Sherry, called her cousin who picked her up and took her to get the children. When they arrived home around 1800, they could see the TV was on and the curtains were open. The kids rush in and there are no lights on. When Sherry Mm. turns the lights on, she finds her mother laying six feet from the door with her daughter's pooh bear blanket thrown over her head. Mm. She is partially naked and her bra and shirt are pushed back to her neck. There is blood next to her head and a bloody auto body hammer near her body. Sherry grabs the kids and they run next door to call for help. Investigators arrive and discover again there is no forced entry. 
They believe the attacker entered through an open garage door that was still open when Sherry arrived home. Mm. They find that Patricia's purse has been rifled through and there is no money in the wallet. Her attacker had not only beaten her with a hammer and robbed her, but he had sexually assaulted her as well. The autopsy determined she had 17 wounds to the head and she died of multiple blows. Evidence is collected from her sexual assault. Wow. However, back then, DNA is... It baffles me that they knew well enough to hold on to that stuff. Investigators fingerprint Sherry and the rest of the family and ask about any enemies that her mother might have had. Sherry mentions a few from Nebraska where they had moved from, but the worst thing she can think of is one subject who might blame her mom for their divorce. Investigators look into these leads but find no evidence that anyone is involved in the murder. That same day that Patricia is found, Donna Holm is attacked in Aurora, Colorado, 25 miles away. Donna Holm had just moved into a condo with her then-boyfriend, now-husband, Ronald. He was a pilot and she was a flight attendant. The two had met at work and fallen in love. That day, Ronald had left for a flight and Donna went to the grocery store and checked the mail on her way back in. She pulled into the garage and that's where she is attacked when she gets out of her car. Ronald returns home the next day to find blood outside on the stoop leading into the condo where there is blood on the carpet and blood leading to Donna, who is in bed, surrounded by blood with a hole in her head, grunting. Donna is admitted to ICU, and investigators quickly rule out Ron as a suspect. Again, there's no sign of forced entry. From the evidence found, they believe that Donna is attacked in the garage as she gets out of her vehicle. Her attacker then pulls Donna to the passenger side of the car, where he knocks her unconscious and sexually assaults her. Her clothing and boots were found on the floor in the garage. There's a lot of blood found in the garage as well, and a bloody ball pin hammer is found on the driver's side of her car. Mm. Donna suffers from severe head injuries, wakes up confused with no memory of the attack. So she woke up in the garage, and she felt kind of off and confused, obviously, and she thought that she was drunk and just had too much to drink. So she stumbles inside into the bathroom and throws up, because when you have a head injury, you throw up. And then she gets into bed and lays down. Ron sleeps at the foot of her bed at the hospital with a gun for two days to protect her until the police assign her protection at the hospital. From all the media attention, he was concerned that whoever attacked her would find out she was still alive and return to finish the job. To silence her? Yeah. Yeah. Donna can only remember some things about her attack. She cannot remember the sexual assault, but she remembers waking up in the garage and then walking into the condo, falling multiple times on her way in. She remembers throwing up and thinking that she was going to die. Because it is winter, the cold weather helped coagulate Donna's blood. If it had been summertime, the heat would have led her to bleed out. Donna was in the hospital for a few weeks and felt like she had the mentality of a two-year-old. When she was ready to be released, they told her about the attack. This is a quote. That's when the policeman and a therapist from the hospital were in my room and told me about what happened to this girl. And I'm crying and I thought, oh, how sad it is for her. And they kept saying... Well, that was you. And it's like, I don't know anything of what you are talking about. I just think it's really sad. Mm. And the year after her attack, Donna recovered and she and Ron got engaged and married in a friend's backyard. She had to relearn everything. Donna felt as if it was a blessing that she couldn't quite remember her attack. But she said, people would always say, oh, you're so lucky. Well, in all honesty, back then, I didn't feel so lucky. I would be like, no, you're lucky it didn't happen to you because I had Mm. to rebuild it. I had to learn everything all over again, and it's very overwhelming and tough to go through. In the People Investigate episode I watched about Mm -hmm. this case, it was really cute because her husband's there with her, and they're still together, and you can just tell how much they love each other, and he just talks about how she's, like, the most amazing woman he knows, and, like, Mm. about how far she's come, and how proud he is of her, and I just thought it was really cute because... Marriage is hard anyway, but thinking about how he had to watch her go through that and how he had to help her relearn everything and he still yeah. stood by her, it's it's yeah. crazy. And she returned to work a year later. Like, she wow. put in the work and she returned to work and obviously she wasn't fine, but she was able to function at least, yeah. which is just crazy to me because head injuries are, are crazy in themselves, but to be hit in the head with a hammer and to lay there to die, like, he obviously left yeah. her to die. Right, yeah. And then for her to make that much progress and him to stick by her and they got married and it's just kind of amazing that Truly he... Truly devoted. Yeah, so... Um, this is where I'm going to stop this episode and we'll finish the story in the next episode. But what are your thoughts so far? 
I mean, it's been, it's actually been a while since we've talked about like a serial, not necessarily serial killer, but a serial. Well, he's definitely a serial perpetrator. Rapist. Yeah. Of somebody responsible for multiple unrelated crimes. It's been a while since we've had something like that. And I think it just really, really sheds light on how clear it is that these people just function differently. That their brains, their brain chemicals and all that kind of stuff, like a massive imbalance there. To crave out that sort of violence, to like literally go house to house until you find somebody or wait until somebody comes home and leaves their garage open and with the opportunity in which you can carry out this obvious need for such a violent attack is like truly deranged not to mention how obviously the attacks are somehow arousing to him because yeah he rapes them after he attacks them yeah it's just just, like we said we'll never understand right because yeah (laughs) logical and you know he obviously has no care about humans or life at all no And no, like, empathy, none of that to be able to look at, like, he's not looking at his victim as as people. Mm -mm. And then he doesn't really take a lot from them, right? He, like, goes to their purse and takes the cash that he can get. It's like he's getting what he wants from the crime itself. Mm -hmm. It seems like that's the real reason behind all the attacks. Not to get money or valuables. He just wants to beat somebody. And the fact that he took the hammers Mm -hmm. with him... He obviously sat and thought about it, was prepared, knew what he wanted to do. And it's weird, too, because in some cases, right, the offender wants the woman to be alone completely, but it doesn't seem like he even cared if the woman was alone. Like, he didn't care who was at the home. He didn't care if there was children there. Right. And for one person to think, too, it's, in a way, it's kind of like, it's all crazy, but it's kind of crazy to me that he thought, no matter how many people are in the home... I'm going to be able to beat them all with this hammer before anyone's going to be able to do anything to me. You know what I mean? I wonder if that was even a thought on his radar. Like if it was so like instinctually driven, right? Because it's Mm -hmm. one, like he, he had this spree before he was caught and then he was caught for the attack in Kingman and then he went to jail and then he escaped during his transport and didn't lay low no. so he could get away. He immediately committed the same type of crime. Yeah, he didn't even go straight for a payphone. He just... Yeah, yeah, exactly. He didn't get out of the area. Like, highways run through there. Semi-truck drivers pick up hitchhikers all the time. Like, he didn't even try to get out of the area first. He had this need and this itch to take care of this violent instinct he had that he couldn't even wait. It's that that gives me the impression that he's so singularly focused Mm -hmm. that like maybe that's why he didn't care who was else who else was in the home because it was like, well, it doesn't matter because I'm going I have to carry this out. And they're just, I just get another victim out of it. I just get to do this to another person. Like, like there was no real thought process behind it. He was just yeah. like, I want to take this hammer and beat someone. I'm going to go look yeah. for an open door until I find right. someone. It doesn't matter who's there because that's not what I'm thinking about. Yeah. yeah. That like animal response almost. And he Except ad- animals don't do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> And he admitted. Animals are much more lo- like... <laughs> You know, it's funny. Instincts actually make sense. (laughs) Is later somebody who says, I would describe him as an animal, but animals actually have a purpose. So it's funny that you said that. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. And it's like animals have instincts for a reason Mm -hmm. to like help them survive and like for food, food and there's no reason that he has this instinct. So I'm iffy on even calling it an instinct. It's like a drive. Let's call it a drive. Rather than or like a instinct. like a compulsion like he can't compulsion is good yes yes yeah he admitted later too that the reason he didn't attack roy or the berries with a hammer was because he didn't have one with him like when he attacked roy he had hitchhiked so he didn't really have anything with him so he used a rock because it's all he could find and then when he went to attack the berries he found that axe handle the broken handle and he was like this will do wow yeah so obviously his weapon of choice is a hammer but when he didn't have one he was just like i'm gonna use whatever i can find this close enough yeah yeah the other thing that i take away is something that we've said from episode zero 
lock your doors. Yes. Like, this is a very clear example of being a crime of opportunity, right? Like, it's not about being paranoid. It's not about being untrusting. It's about just protecting yourself. Like, and this was back in the 80s. So it's not like times of change, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, people always should lock their doors. Like, let's be real. <laughs> you know, I accidentally left the garage door open one night, all night. And I am just thankful that nothing like this ever happened. Because I wasn't used to having a garage door, so I wasn't really thinking about it. But literally every night since then, I check the garage like four times before I go to sleep, which yeah. may seem excessive. But then when I hear stories like this, I'm like, no, a Brittany, time, maybe. good job. <laughs> yeah. Not only are you protecting yourself, you're protecting your children. So there's that. The but world is crazy. And just, I mean, bare minimum, lock your door. <laughs> yeah. Lock all the doors. Lock the windows. Everything. Add that to our 12 pillars, Jess. So I have to warn you, next episode, it's just going to get worse, Jess. <laughs> I mean, at this point, it goes without saying because you do say that in every episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I just keep saying, yeah, it gets worse. Yeah, it gets worse. <laughs> yeah. You want to hear about it? And you're like, mm, do I? All I'm saying is if this episode made you angry and be like, oh, this sucks, Next week, guys, it's just going to get worse, so just take a deep breath, okay? Before you listen. That's our that's our take tag. Take a deep line. breath. Truth lies and alibis. It's just going to get worse. A hundred percent. Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at truthliesandalibis.com.